Section number seven of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Darby. Voice over Pete Darby. Dot com. Perfect Love, Part One, by the Comtesse de Morin, translated by James Planchet. Part One. In one of those agreeable countries subject to the Empire of the Fairies, reigned the redoubtable Dinamo. She was learned in her art, cruel in her deeds, and proud of the honour of being descended from the celebrated Calypso whose charms had the glory and the power, by detaining the famous Ulysses, to triumph over the prudence of the conquerors of Troy. She was tall, fierce-looking, and her haughty spirit had with much difficulty been subjected to the rigid laws of Hymen. Love had never been able to reach her heart, but the idea of uniting a flourishing kingdom to that of which she was queen, and another which she had usurped, had induced her to marry an old monarch who was one of her neighbours. He died a few years after his marriage, and left the queen with one daughter, named Azir. She was exceedingly ugly, but did not appear so in the eyes of Dinamo, who thought her charming, perhaps because she was the very image of herself. She was the heiress also to three kingdoms, a circumstance which softened down many defects, and her hand was sought in marriage by all the most powerful princes of the adjacent provinces. Their eagerness— joined to the blind affection of Dinamo, rendered her vanity insupportable. She was ardently besought. She must, therefore, be worthy of such solicitation. It was thus that the fairy and the princess reasoned in their minds, and enjoyed the pleasure of deceiving themselves. Meanwhile Dinamo thought only of rendering the happiness of the princess as perfect as she considered was her due, and, with this object, brought up in her palace a young prince, the son of her brother. His name was Prince Saint Parcinet. He had a noble bearing, a graceful figure, a profusion of beautiful fair hair. Love might have been jealous of his power, for that deity had never, amongst his golden-pointed arrows, any so certain to triumph irresistibly over hearts as the fine eyes of Prince Saint Parcinet. He could do everything well that he chose to undertake, danced and sang to perfection, and bore off all the prizes in the tournament whenever he took the trouble to contend for them. This young prince was the delight of the court, and Dinamo, who had her motives for it, made no objection to the homage and admiration which he received. The king, who was the father of Parsonet, was the fairy's brother. She declared war against him, without even seeking for a reason. The king fought valiantly at the head of his troops, but what could any army effect against the power of so skilful a fair his Dinamo? She allowed the victory to remain in doubt only long enough for her unfortunate brother to fall in the combat. As soon as he was dead, she dispersed all her enemies with one stroke of her wand, and made herself mistress of the kingdom. Pince and Parcinet was at that time still in his cradle. They brought him to Dinamo. It would have been in vain to attempt hiding him from a fairy. He already displayed those seductive graces which win the heart. Dinamo caressed him, and a few days afterwards took him with her to her own dominions. The prince had attained the age of eighteen when the fairy, desirous at length of executing the designs which she had so many years contemplated, resolved to marry Parsin Parsinet to the princess, her daughter. She never for a moment doubted the infinite delight which that young prince, born to a throne, and condemned by misfortune to remain a subject, would feel at becoming in one day the sovereign of three kingdoms. She sent for the princess, and revealed to her the choice she had made of her husband for her. The princess listened to this disclosure with an emotion which caused the fairy to believe that this resolution in favour of Pince and Pincinet was not agreeable to her daughter. "'I see clearly,' she said to her, as she perceived her agitation increasing, 
that thou hast much more ambition, and wouldst unite with thine own empire that one of those kings who have so often proposed for thee. But where is the king whom Parsin Parsinet cannot conquer? In courage he surpasses them all. The subjects of so perfect a prince might one day rebel in his favour. In giving thee to him, I secure to thee the possession of his kingdom. As to his person, it is unnecessary to speak. Thou knowest that the proudest beauties have not been able to resist his charms. The princess, suddenly flinging herself at the feet of the fairy, interrupted her discourse, and confessed to her that her heart had not been able to defy the young victor, famous for so many conquests. But, she added, blushing, I have given a thousand proofs of my affection to the insensible Parsin Parsinet, and he has received them with a coldness which distracts me. "'Tis because he dares not raise his thoughts so high as thee,' replied the haughty fairy. "'He fears, no doubt, to offend me, and I appreciate his respect.' This flattering idea was too agreeable to the inclination and the vanity of the princess for her not to be persuaded of its truth— the fairy ended by sending for Parsin Parsinet. He came and found her in a magnificent cabinet, where she awaited him with the princess, her daughter. "'Call all thy courage to thy assistance,' said she to him as soon as he appeared, "'not to support affliction, but to prevent being overcome by thy good fortune. Thou art called to a throne, Parsin Parsinet, and to crown thy happiness thou wilt mount that throne by espousing my daughter. I, madam, exclaimed the young prince, with an astonishment in which it was easy to perceive that joy had no share. I espouse the princess, continued he, retreating a few paces. <laughs> what deity is meddling with my fate? Why does he not leave the care of it to the only one from whom I implore assistance? These words were uttered by the prince, with a vehemence in which his heart took too much part to allow it to be controlled by his prudence. The fairy imagined that the unhoped-for happiness had driven Parsin Parsinet out of his wits. But the princess loved him, and love sometimes renders lovers more keen-sighted than even wisdom. "'From what deity, Parsin Parsinet?' said she to him with emotion. "'Do you implore assistance so fondly? "'I feel too deeply that I have no share in the prayers you address to him.' "'The young prince, who had had time to recover from his first surprise, "'and who was conscious of the imprudence he had committed, "'summoned his brain to the assistance of his heart.' He answered the princess with more gallantry than she had hoped for, and thanked the fairy with an air of dignity that sufficiently proved him to be worthy not only of the empire that was afforded him, but of that of the whole world. Dinamo and her proud daughter were satisfied with his expressions, and they settled everything before they left the apartment the fairy deferring the wedding-day a short time, only to give opportunity to all her court to prepare for this grand solemnity. The news of the marriage of Parsin Parsinet and Azir was spread throughout the palace the moment they had quitted the Queen's cabinet. Crowds came to congratulate the prince. However unamiable the princess, it was to high fortune she conducted him. Parsin Parsinet received all these honours with an air of indifference, which surprised his new subjects the more, for that they detected beneath it extreme affliction and anxiety. He was compelled, however, to endure for the rest of the day the eager homage of the whole court, and the ceaseless demonstrations of affection lavished upon him by Azir. What a situation for a young prince, a prey to the keenest anguish! Night seemed to him to have delayed its return a thousand times longer than usual. The impatient Parsin Parsinet prayed for its arrival. It came at length. He quitted precipitately the place in which he had suffered so much. He retired to his own apartments, and having dismissed his attendants, opened a door, which led into the palace gardens, and hurried through them, followed only by a young slave." A beautiful, but not very extensive, river ran at the end of the gardens, and separated from the magnificent palace of the fairy a little chateau, flanked by four towers, and surrounded by a tolerably deep moat, 
which was filled by the river aforesaid. It was to this fatal spot that the vows and sighs of Pont Saint Parcenet were incessantly wafted. What a miracle was confined in it! Danamo had the treasure carefully guarded within it. It was a young princess, the daughter of her sister, who, dying, had confided to her the charge of the fairy. Her beauty, worthy the admiration of the universe, appeared too dangerous to Danamo to allow her to be seen by the side of Azir. Permission was occasionally accorded to the charming Irolite, so was she named, to come to the palace and visit the fairy and the princess her daughter, but she had never been allowed to appear in public. Her dawning beauties were unknown to the world, but there was one who was not ignorant of them. They had met the eyes of Palsan Palsinet one day at the apartment of the princess Azir, and he had adored Yolite from the moment that he had seen her. Their near relationship afforded no privilege to that young prince. From the time Yolite ceased to be an infant, the pitiless Danamo suffered no one to behold her. Nevertheless, Pars and Parsinet burned with a flame as ardent as such charms as Yolite could not fail to kindle. She was just fourteen, her beauty was perfect. Her hair was of a charming colour. Without being decidedly dark or fair, her complexion had all the freshness of spring. Her mouth was lovely, her teeth admirable, her smile fascinating. She had large hazel eyes, sparkling and tender, and her glances appeared to say a thousand things which her young heart was ignorant of. She had been brought up in complete solitude— Near as was the palace of the fairy to the chateau in which she dwelt, she saw no more persons than she might have seen in the midst of deserts. Danamo's orders to this effect were strictly followed. The lovely Irolite passed her days amongst the women appointed to attend her. They were few in number, but little as were the advantages to be gained in so solitary and circumscribed a court. Fame, which feared not at Danamo, published such wonders of this young princess— that ladies of the highest rank were eager to share the seclusion of the youthful Irolite. Her appearance confirmed all that fame had reported. They were always finding some new charm to admire in her. A governess of great intelligence and prudence, formerly attached to the princess who was the mother of Irolite, had been allowed to remain with her, and frequently bewailed the rigorous conduct of Danamo towards her young mistress. Her name was Mana. Her desire to restore the princess to the liberty she was entitled to enjoy, and the position she was born to occupy, had induced her to favour the love of Pars and Pars Rinet. It was now three years since he had contrived to introduce himself one evening into the chateau in the dress of a slave. He found Irolite in the garden, and declared his passion for her. She was then but a charming child— she loved Pansin Pansinet as if he had been her brother, and could not then comprehend the existence of any warmer attachment. Mana, who was rarely absent from the side of Irolite, surprised the young prince in the garden. He avowed to her his love for the princess, and the determination he had formed to perish, or restore her one day to liberty, and then to seek by personal appeal to his former subjects a glorious means of revenging himself upon Dinamo, and placing Irolite upon the throne. The noble qualities which were daily developed in the nature of Pars and Parsinet might have rendered probable his success in still more difficult undertakings, and it was also the only hope of rescue which offered itself to Irolite. Mana allowed him to visit the chateau occasionally after nightfall. He saw Irolite only in her presence— but he spoke to her of his love, and never ceased endeavouring by tender words and devoted attentions to inspire her with a passion as ardent as his own. For three years Pals and Palsinet had been occupied solely with this passion. Nearly every night he visited the chateau of his princess, and all his days he passed in thinking of her. We left him on his road through Danamo's gardens, followed by a slave, and absorbed in the despair to which the determination of the fairy had reduced him. He reached the river's bank, 
a little gilded boat moored to the shore, in which Aziel sometimes enjoyed an excursion on the water, enabled the enamoured prince to cross the stream. The slave rowed him over, and as soon as Balsan Parsinet had ascended the silken ladder which was thrown to him from a little terrace that extended along the entire front of the chateau, the faithful servant rowed the boat back to its mooring place, and remained with it there until a signal was made to him by his master. This was the waving, for a few minutes, of a lighted flambeau on the terrace. This evening the prince took his usual route. The silken ladder was thrown to him, and he reached without any obstacle the apartment of the youthful Irolite. He found her stretched on a couch and bathed in tears. How beautiful did she appear to him in her affliction! Her charms had never before affected the young prince so deeply. "'What is the matter, my princess?' asked he, flinging himself on his knees before the couch on which she lay. "'What can have caused these precious tears to flow? Alas!' he continued, sighing. "'Have I still more misfortunes to learn here?' The young lovers mingled their tears and sighs, and were forced to give full vent to their sorrow before they could find words to declare its cause. At length the young prince entreated Irolite to tell him what new severity the fairy had treated her with. "'She would compel you to marry Azir,' replied the beautiful Irolite, blushing, "'which of all her cruelties could cause me so much agony.' "'Oh, my dear princess!' exclaimed the prince. "'You fear I shall marry Azir? "'My lot is a thousand times more happy than I could have imagined it.' "'Can you exult in your destiny?' sadly rejoined the princess, "'when it threatens to separate us. "'I cannot express to you the tortures that I suffer from this fear.' Ah, oh, Parsin, Parsin, you were right. The love I bear to you is far different from that I should feel for a brother. The enamoured prince blessed fortune for her severities. Never before had the young heart of Irolite appeared to him truly touched by love, and now he could no longer doubt having inspired her with a passion as tender as his own. This unlooked-for happiness renewed all his hopes. No, he exclaimed with rapture, I no longer despair of overcoming our difficulties, since I am convinced of your affection. Let us fly, my princess, let us escape from the fury of Dinamo and her hateful daughter, let us seek a home more favourable to the indulgence of that love in which alone consists our happiness. How, rejoined the young princess with astonishment, depart with you, and what would all the kingdom say of my flight? "'Away with such idle fears, beautiful Irolite!' interrupted the impatient Parsin Parsinet. "'Everything urges us to quit this spot. Let us hasten!' "'But whither?' asked the prudent Mana, who had been present during the entire interview, and who, less preoccupied than these young lovers, foresaw all the difficulties in the way of their flight. "'I have plans which I will lay before you,' answered Parsin Parsinet. But how did you become so soon acquainted here with the news of the fairy's court? One of my relatives, replied Mana, wrote to me the instant that the rumour was circulated through the palace, and I thought it my duty to inform the princess. What have I not suffered since that moment? said the lovely Irolite. No, Parsin Parsinet, I cannot live without you. The young prince, in a transport of love, and enchanted by these words, imprinted on the beautiful hand of Irolite a passionate and tender kiss, which had all the charms of a first and precious favour. The day began to dawn, and warned Parsinet too soon that it was time for him to retire. He promised the princess he would return the following night to reveal his plans for their escape. He found his faithful slave in waiting with the boat, and returned to his apartments. He was enraptured with the delight of being beloved by the fair Irolite, and agitated by the obstacles which he clearly perceived would have to be surmounted. Sleep could neither calm his anxiety, nor make him for one moment forget his happiness. The morning sun had scarcely lighted his chamber when a dwarf presented him with a magnificent scarf from the Princess Azir, who, in a note more tender than Pansan Parsinet would have desired, entreated him to wear it constantly from that moment. He returned an answer, which it embarrassed him much to compose, but Irolite was to be rescued, and what constraint would he not have himself endured to restore her to liberty? He had no sooner dismissed the dwarf than a giant arrived to present him, from Danamo, with a sabre of extraordinary beauty. 
the hilt was formed by a single stone more brilliant than a diamond and which emitted so dazzling a lustre that it would light the way by night upon its blade were engraven these words for the hand of a conqueror parsin parsinet was pleased with this present he went to thank the fairy for it, and entered her apartment, wearing the marvellous sabre she had sent him, and the beautiful scarf he had received from Azir. The assurance of Irolide's affection for him had relieved him from all anxiety, and filled his bosom with that gentle and perfect happiness which is born of mutual love. An air of joy was apparent in all his actions. Azir attributed it to the effect of her own charms, and the fairy to satisfied ambition. The day passed in entertainments, which could not diminish the insupportable length of it, to Paz and Pazinet. In the evening they walked in the palace gardens, and were rowed on that very river with which the prince was so well acquainted. His heart beat quickly as he stepped into that little boat. What a difference between the pleasure to which it was accustomed to bear him, and the dreary dullness of his present position! Parsin Parsinet could not help casting frequent glances toward the dwelling of the charming Irolite. She did not make her appearance upon the terrace of the chateau, for there was an express order that she was not to be permitted to leave her chamber whenever the fairy Orazia was on the water. The latter, who narrowly watched all the prince's actions, observed that he often looked in that direction. "'What are you gazing at, Prince?' said she. "'Amidst all the honours that surround you, is the prison of Irolite deserving so much attention?' "'Yes, madam,' replied the Prince, very imprudently. "'I feel for those who have not drawn on themselves by their own misconduct the misfortunes they endure.' "'You are too compassionate,' replied Azir contemptuously. "'But to relieve your anxiety,' added she, lowering her voice, "'I can inform you that Irolite will not long continue a prisoner.' "'And what is to become of her, then?' hastily inquired the young prince. "'The queen will marry her in a few days to Prince Ormond,' answered Azir. "'He is, as you know, a kinsman of ours, and agreeable to the queen's intentions. "'The day after the nuptials he will conduct Irolite to one of his fortresses, "'from whence she will never return to the court.' How! exclaimed Parsin Parsinet with extraordinary emotion, will the queen bestow that beautiful princess on so frightful a prince, and whose vices exceed even his ugliness? What cruelty! The latter word escaped his lips despite himself, but he could no longer be false to his courage and his heart. Methinks it is not for you, Parsin Parsinet, retorted Azir haughtily to complain of the cruelties of Dinamo. This conversation would no doubt have been carried too far for the young prince, whose safety lay in dissimulation. When, fortunately for Parsin and Parsinet, some of the ladies in waiting on Azir approached her, and a moment afterwards the fairy having appeared on the bank of the river, Azir signified her desire to rejoin her. On landing, Parsin Parsinet pretended indisposition in order to obtain least the liberty of lamenting alone his new misfortunes. The fairy, and more particularly Azir, testified great anxiety respecting his illness. He returned to his own apartments. There he indulged in a thousand complaints against destiny for the ills it threatened to inflict on the charming Irolite, abandoned himself to all his grief and all his passion, and beginning at length to seek consolation for suffering so agonizing to a faithful lover, wrote a letter full of the most moving phrases that his affection could dictate to one of his aunts, who was a fairy as well as Dinamo but who found as much pleasure in befriending the unfortunate as Duramo did in making them miserable. Her name was Favorable. The prince explained to her the cruel situation to which love and fate had reduced him, and not being able to absent himself from the court of Dinamo without betraying the design he had formed, he sent his faithful slave with the letter to Favorable. When every one had retired to rest, he left his apartment as usual, crossed the gardens alone, and, stepping into the little boat, took up one of the oars, 
without knowing whether or not he could manage to use it. But what can a glove teach his votaries? He can instruct them in much more difficult matters. He enabled Parsen Parsinet to row with as much skill and rapidity as the most expert waterman. He entered the chateau, and was much surprised to find no one but the prudent Mana, weeping bitterly in the princess's chamber. "'What affects you, Mana?' asked the prince, eagerly. "'And where is my dear Irolite?' "'Alas, my lord,' replied Mana, "'she is no longer here. A troop of the queen's guards, and some women in whom she apparently confides, removed the princess from the castle about three or four hours ago.' Parsin Parsinet heard not the last of these sad words. He sunk insensible on the ground the instant he learned the departure of the princess. Mana, with great difficulty, restored him to consciousness. He recovered from his swoon only to give way to a, a sudden paroxysm of fury. He drew a small dagger from his girdle, and had pierced his heart, if the prudent Mana, dragging back his arm as best she could, and falling at the same time on her knees, had not exclaimed, "'How, my lord, would you abandon Irolite? Live to save her from the wrath of Dinamo! Alas, without you, how will she find protection from the fairy's cruelty?' These words suspended for a moment the despair of the wretched prince. "'Alas!' replied he, shedding tears, which all his courage could not distrain, "'Whither have they borne my princess?' "'Yes, Mana, I will live to enjoy at least the sad satisfaction of dying in her defence, and in avenging her on her enemies.' After these words, Mana conjured him to quit the fatal building, to avoid fresh misfortunes. "'Hasten, prince,' said she to him, "'how know we that the fairy has not here some spy ready to acquaint her with everything that passes within these walls?' Be careful of a life so dear to the princess whom you adore. I will let you know all that I can contrive to learn respecting her. The prince departed after this promise, and regained his chamber, oppressed with all the grief which so tender and so luckless a passion could inspire. He passed the night on a couch on which he had thrown himself on entering the room. Daybreak surprised him there, and the morning was advanced some hours, when he heard a noise at his chamber door. He ran to it with the eager impatience which we feel when we await tidings in which the heart is deeply interested. He found his people conducting to him a man who desired to speak with him instantly. He recognized the messenger as one of Mana's relations, who placed in the hand of Parsen Parsenet a letter which he took with him into his cabinet to read, in order to conceal the emotion its receipt excited in him. He opened it hastily, having observed it was in Mana's handwriting and found these words. Mana, to the greatest prince in the world, be comforted, my lord. Our princess is in safety, if such an expression be allowable, so long as she is subjected to the power of her enemy. She requested Dinamo to permit my attendance on her, and the fairy consented that I should rejoin her. She is confined in the palace. Yesterday evening, the Queen caused her to be brought into her cabinet, ordered her to look upon Prince Ormond as one who would be in a few days her husband, and presented to her that prince so unworthy of being your rival. The princess was so distressed that she could answer the Queen only by tears. They have not yet ceased to flow. It is for you, my lord, to find, if possible, some means of escape from the impending calamity." At the foot of the letter were the following lines, written with a trembling hand, and some of the words being nearly effaced. How I pity you, my dear prince! Your sufferings are more terrible to me than my own. I spare your feelings the recital of what I have endured since yesterday. Why was I born to disturb your peace? Alas! Had you never known me, perhaps you might have been happy. What? mingled emotions of joy and grief agitated the heart of the young prince in reading this postscript. What kisses did he not imprint upon this precious token of love of the divine Irolite? He was so excited that it was with the greatest difficulty in the world that he succeeded in writing a coherent answer. He thanked the prudent Mana. He informed the princess of the assistance he expected from the fairy favorable. And what did he not say? to her of his grief or his love. 
he then took the letter to Mana's kinsman, and presented him with a clasp set with jewels of inestimable beauty and value as an earnest of the reward he had deserved for the pleasure he had given him. Mana's kinsman had scarcely departed when the Queen and Princess Azir sent to inquire how the Prince had passed the night. It was easily seen by his countenance that he was not well. He was entreated to return to his bed, and as he felt he should be under less restraint there than in the company of the fairy, he consented to do so. After dinner, the Queen came to see him, and spoke to him of the marriage of Irolite and Prince Ormond, as of a matter she had decided upon. Parsin Parsinet, who had at length made up his mind to control himself, so as not to awaken suspicions which might frustrate his designs, pretended to approve of the fairy's intentions, and only requested her to await his perfect recovery, as it was his wish to be present to the festivities which would take place on the occasion of these grand nuptials. The fairy and Azir, who were in despair about his illness, promised him everything he desired, and Palsan Palsinet thus retarded for some days at least the threatened marriage of Irolite. His conversation with Azir, when on the water with her, had hastened the approach of that misfortune to the beautiful princess he loved so tenderly. Azir had related to the queen the words of Parsin Parsinet, and the pity he had expressed for Irolite. The queen, who never paused in the execution of what she had determined on, sent that very evening for Irolite, and decided in conjunction with Azir that the marriage of the former should immediately take place and that her departure should be expedited before Parsin Parsinet was established in the higher authority his match with Azir would invest him with. Before ten days had expired, however, the prince's faithful slave returned from his mission. With what delight did the prince discover in the latter Ferrabla had written to him the proofs of her compassion of her friendship, for him and for Irolite. She sent him a ring— made of four separate metals, gold, silver, brass, and iron. This ring had the power to save him four times from the persecution of the cruel Danamo, and Favrable assured the prince that the fairy would not order him to be pursued more often than that ring was able to protect him. These good tidings restored the prince to health, and he sent with all speed for Mana's kinsman. He entrusted him with a letter for Irolite, informing her of the success they might hope for. There was no time to be lost. The Queen had determined the wedding of Irolite should take place in three days. That evening there was to be a ball given by the Princess Azir. Irolite was to be present. Parsin Parsinet could not endure the idea of her being en négligé, as his recent illness might have permitted him. He dressed himself in the most magnificent style and looked more brilliant than the sun. He dared not at first speak to the fair Irolite, but what did not their eyes discourse when occasionally they ventured a glance at each other? Irolite was in the most beautiful costume in the world. The fairy had presented her with some marvellous jewels, and as she had only four days to remain in the palace, Danamo had resolved, during that short period, to treat her with all due honour. Her beauty, which had hitherto been unadorned in such splendour, appeared wonderful to the whole court, and above all to the enamoured Parsin Parsinet. He even imagined he could read in some joyous flashes of her bright eyes an acknowledgment that she had received his letter. Prince Ormond addressed Irolite frequently, but he was so ill-looking, notwithstanding the golden jewels with which he was burdened, that he was not a rival worth the jealousy of the young prince. The ball was nearly over, when Parsin Parsinet, carried away by his love, wished with intense ardour for an opportunity to speak for one moment to his princess. "'Cruel queen! And thou also, hateful Azir!' he mentally exclaimed. "'Will ye still longer deprive me of the delightful pleasure of repeating a thousand times to the beautiful Irolite that I adore her?' Jealous witness of my happiness! Why do you not quit this spot? Love can only triumph in your absence. Scarcely had Bouncin Parsinet formed this witch, than the fairy, feeling rather faint, 
called to Azir, and passed with her into an adjoining apartment, followed by Ormond. Parsin Barzinet had on his finger the ring which the fairy Favorable had sent him, and which had the power to rescue him four times from the persecutions of Dinamo. He should have reserved such certain help for the most pressing necessity. But when did violent love obey the dictates of prudence? The young prince was convinced by the sudden departure of the fairy and Azir that the ring had begun to favour his love. He flew to the fair Eolite. He spoke to her of his affection in terms more ardent than eloquent. He felt that he had perhaps invoked the spell of Favorable too thoughtlessly. But could he regret an imprudence which obtained for him the sweet gratification of speaking to his dear Eolite? They agreed as to the place and hour at which the next day they would meet to fly from their painful bondage. The fairy and his ear, after some time, returned to the ballroom. Pals and Parsinet separated with great regret from Irolite. He looked at the fatal ring, and perceived that the iron had mixed with the other metals, and was no longer distinguishable. He therefore saw too clearly that he had only three more wishes to make. He resolved to render them more truly serviceable to the princess than the first had been. He confided the secret of his flight to no one but his faithful slave, and passed the rest of that night in making all the necessary preparations. The next morning he calmly presented himself to the Queen, and appeared even in better spirits than usual. He jested with Prince Ormond on his marriage, and conducted himself in such a manner as to lull all suspicions, had any existed, as to his intentions. Two hours after midnight he repaired to the fairy's park. He found there his faithful slave, who, in obedience to his master's orders, had brought thither four of his horses. The prince was not kept long waiting. The lovely Irolite appeared, walking with faltering steps, and leaning upon Mana. The young princess felt some pain in taking this course. It had needed all the cruelties of Donamo, and all the bad qualities of Ormor, to induce her to do so. Love alone had not sufficed to persuade her. End of section 7 Recording by Peter Darby Voice over Pete Darby dot com Section number 8 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Peter Darby Voice over Pete Darby dot com Perfect Love by the Countess de Morin Translated by James Planchet Part 2 It was autumn. The night was beautiful, and the moon, with a host of brilliant stars, illuminated the sky, shedding around a more charming light than that of day. The prince eagerly advanced to meet his beloved. There was no time for long speeches. Parsin Parsinet tenderly kissed the hand of Irolite and assisted her to mount her horse. Fortunately, she rode admirably. It was one of the amusements she had taken pleasure in during her captivity. She had frequently ridden with her attendants in a little wood close to the chateau she resided in, and of which the fairy allowed her the range. Parsin Parsinet, after the interchange of a few words with the princess, mounted his own horse. The other two were for Mana and the faithful slave. The prince, then drawing the brilliant sabre he had received from the fairy, swore on it to adore the beautiful Irolite as long as he should live, and to die, if it were necessary, in defending her from her enemies. They then set out, and it seemed as if the Zephyrs were in league with them, or that they mistook Irolite for Flora, for they accompanied them in their flight. Morning disclosed to Dinamo the unexpected event. The ladies in attendance on Irolite were surprised that she slept so much later than usual, but, in obedience to the orders the prudent Mana had given them overnight, they did not venture to enter the princess's apartment without being summoned by her. Mana slept in Irolite's chamber, and they had quitted it by a small door that opened into a courtyard of the palace, that was very little frequented. This door was in Irolite's cabinet. 
It had been fastened up, but with a little trouble, in two or three evenings, they had found means to open it. The Queen, at length, sent orders for Irolite to come to her. The fairy's commands were not to be disobeyed by any one. They accordingly knocked at the chamber door of the princess. They received no answer. Prince Ormond arrived. He came to conduct Irolite to the Queen, and was much surprised to find them knocking loudly at the door. He caused it to be broken open. They entered, and finding the little door of the cabinet had been forced, no longer doubted that the princess had fled the palace. They bore these tidings to the Queen, who trembled with rage at hearing them. She ordered a search to be made everywhere for Irolite, but in vain did they endeavour to obtain a clue to her evasion. No one knew anything about it. Prince Ormond himself set out in pursuit of Irolite. The fairy's guards were dispatched in all haste, and in every direction it was thought possible she might have taken. It was observed, however, by Azir, that amidst this general agitation, Parsin Pansinet had not made his appearance. She sent an urgent message to him, and jealousy opening her eyes, she felt certain that the prince had carried off Eolite, though she had not until that moment suspected he was in love with her. The fairy could not believe it, but she hastened to consult her books, and discovered that Azir's suspicion was but too well founded. In the meanwhile, that princess, having learned that Parsin Parsinet was not in his apartments, and could not be found anywhere in the palace, sent some one to the chateau in which Irolite had so long resided, to see if they could find any evidence that would convince or acquit the prince. The prudent mana had taken care to leave nothing in it that could betray the understanding that had existed between Irolite and Parsin Parsinet, but they found near the seat on which the prince had lain so long insensible— the scarf Azir had given to him. It had been unfastened during his swoon, and the prince and Mana, absorbed in their grief, had neither of them subsequently observed it. What were the feelings of the haughty Azir at the sight of this scarf? Her love and her pride were equally wounded. She was exasperated beyond measure. She flung into the fairies' prisons all who had been in the service of Irolite or of the prince. Parsin Parsinet's ingratitude to the queen also goaded her naturally furious temper into madness, and she would have willingly parted with one of her kingdoms to be revenged on the two lovers. Meanwhile the fugitives were hotly pursued. Ormon and his troop found everywhere fresh horses in readiness for them by the fairies' orders. Those of Pansin and Basinet were fatigued, and their speed no longer answered to the impatience of their master. As they issued from a forest, Ormond appeared in sight. The first impulse of the young prince was to attack his unworthy rival. He was spurring towards him with his hand on the hilt of his sword, when Irolit exclaimed, "'Prince! Rush not into useless danger! Obey the orders of Favorable!' These words calmed the anger of Pansin and Basinet, and, in obedience to his princess and to the fairy, he wished that the beautiful Irolite was safe from the persecution of the cruel queen. He had scarcely formed the wish, when the earth opened beneath him and Ormond, and presented to his sight a little misshapen man, in a very magnificent dress, who made a sign to him to follow him. The descent was easy on his side. He rode down it accompanied by the fair Irolite. Mana and the faithful slave followed them, and the earth reclosed above them. Ormond, astonished at so extraordinary an event, returned with all speed to inform Danamo. Meanwhile, our young lovers followed the little man down the very dark road, and at the end of which they found a vast palace, lighted only by a great quantity of lamps and flambeaux. They were desired to dismount, and entered a hall of prodigious magnitude. The roof was supported by columns of shining earth covered with golden ornaments, the walls were of the same material. A little man, all covered with jewels, was seated at the end of the hall on a golden throne, surrounded by a great number of persons as misshapen as the one who had conducted the prince to that spot. As soon as the latter appeared, leading the charming Irolite, the little man arose from his throne and said, "'Approach, prince. The great fairy Favorable, who has long been a friend of mine, has requested me to save you from the cruelties of Dinamo. I am the king of the gnomes. You and the fair princess who accompanies you 
a welcome to my palace. Parcin Parcinet thanked him for the succour he had afforded him. The king and all his subjects were enchanted with the beauty of Irolite. They looked upon her as a star that had descended to illuminate their abode. A magnificent banquet was served up to the prince and princess. The king of the gnomes did the honours. Music of a very melodious, though somewhat barbaric, character formed the entertainment of the evening. They sang the charms of Irolite, and the following verses were frequently repeated. What lovely star hath left its sphere, this subterranean realm to cheer? Beware, for in its dazzling light is more than danger to the sight. The while its luster we admire, it sets the gazer's heart on fire. After the concert, the prince and princess were each conducted to magnificent apartments. Mana and the faithful slave attended on them. The next morning they were shown all over the king's palace. He was master of all the treasures contained in the bosom of the earth. It was impossible to add to his riches. They presented a confused mass of beautiful things, but art was wanting everywhere. The prince and princess remained for a week in this subterranean region. Such was the order of Favorable to the king of the gnomes. During this time entertainments were made for the princess and her lover, which, though not very tasteful, were exceedingly magnificent. The eve of their departure, the king, to commemorate their sojourn in his empire, caused statues of them to be erected, one on each side of his throne. They were of gold, and the pedestals of white marble. The following inscription, formed with diamonds, was upon the pedestal of the prince's statue. We desire no longer to behold the sun. We have seen this prince. He is more beautiful and more brilliant. And on that of the princess were these words, formed in a similar manner. To the immortal glory of the goddess of beauty, she descended to this spot under the form and name of Eolite. The ninth day they presented the prince with the most beautiful horses in the world. The harness was of gold entirely covered with diamonds. He quitted the gloomy abode of the gnomes with his little troop, after having expressed his gratitude to the king. He found himself again on the very spot where Ormond had confronted him. He looked at his ring, and perceived that only the silver and brazen portions of it were discernible. He resumed his journey with the charming Egolite, and made all speed to reach the abode of Favorable, where at length they might feel themselves in safety, when all on a sudden, as they emerged from a valley, they encountered a troop of Dinamo's guards, who had not given up the pursuit. The soldiers prepared to rush upon them, when the prince wished, and instantly a large piece of water appeared between the party of Batsan Parsinet and that of the fairy. A beautiful nymph, half-naked in a little boat made of interwoven rushes, was seen in the middle of it. She approached the shore, and requested the prince and princess to enter the boat. Mana and the slave followed them. The horses remained in the plain, and the little boat suddenly sinking, the fairy's guards believed that the fugitives had perished in their attempt to escape. But at the same moment they found themselves in a palace, the walls of which were only great sheets of water, which incessantly falling with perfect regularity formed halls, apartments, cabinets, and surrounded gardens, in which a thousand fountains of the most extraordinary shapes marked out the lines of the parterre. Only the naiads, in whose empire they were, could inhabit this palace, as beautiful as it was singular. To offer, therefore, a more substantial dwelling to the prince and the fair Irolite, the naiad, who was their conductor, led them into some grottoes of shell-work, where coral, pearls, and all the treasures of the deep were seen in dazzling profusion. The beds were of moss. An hundred dolphins guarded the grotto of Irolite, and twenty whales that of Balsan Parsinet. The naiads admired the beauty of the princess, and more than one triton was jealous of the looks and attentions which were bestowed on the young prince. They served up in the grotto of the princess a superb collation composed of all sorts of iced fruits. Twelve sirens endeavoured with their sweet and charming songs to calm the anxiety of young prince and the fair Ilorite. The concert finished with these verses. Wherever with love for our leader we stray, to render us happy he knows the sweet way. Rejoice, perfect lovers, who hear in his name the floods may defy to extinguish your flame. In the evening there was a banquet, at which nothing was served but fish, but of most extraordinary size and exquisite flavour. 
After the banquet the naiads danced a ballet in dresses of fish scales of various colours, which had the most beautiful effect in the world. The horns of tritons, and other instruments unknown to mortals, performed the music which, though strange, was novel and very agreeable. Parsin Parsinet and the beautiful Irolite remained four days in this empire. Such were the commands of Favorable. The fifth day the naiads assembled in crowds to escort the prince and princess. The two lovers were placed in a little boat made of a single shell, and the naiads, half out of the water, accompanied them as far as the border of a river, where Parsin Parsinet found his horses waiting for him, and recommenced his journey with the more haste, as he perceived, on examining his ring, that the silver had disappeared, and that nothing remained but the brass. They were, however, but a short distance from the wished-for dwelling of the fairy Favorable. They travelled unmolested for three more days, but on the fourth morning they saw weapons glitter in the distance in the rays of the rising sun, and as those who bore them advanced they recognised Prince Ormond and his band. Dadamo had sent them back in pursuit with orders not to leave them when seen again, nor to quit the spot where anything extraordinary might occur to them, and above all things to endeavour to engage Pansin Parsinet in single combat. Dadamo had correctly imagined, from the account of Ormond, that a fairy protected the prince and princess, but her science was so great that she did not despair of conquering by spells more potent than her antagonist could cast around them. Ormond, delighted at beholding again the prince and Irolite, whom he had sought with so much toil and anxiety, galloped sword in hand to encounter Pansin Parsinet according to the commands of the fairy. The young prince also drew his sabre with so fierce an air that Ormond more than once felt inclined to waver in his course. But Parsin Parsinet, observing Irolite bathed in tears, touched at the sight, formed his fourth wish, and instantly a great fire, rising almost to the clouds, separated him from his enemy. This fire made Ormond and his troop fall back, while the young prince and Irolite, closely followed by the faithful slave and the prudent Mana, found themselves in a palace, the first sight of which greatly alarmed the fair Irolite. It was entirely of flame but her alarm subsided as she perceived that she felt no more heat than from the rays of the sun, and that this flame had only the brilliancy and blaze of fire, without its more insupportable qualities. Crowds of young and beautiful personages, in dresses over which light flames appeared to wanton, presented themselves to receive the princess and her lover. One amongst them, who they imagined to be the queen of those regions, by the respect that was paid to her, accosted them, saying, "'Come, charming princess, and you also, handsome Parsen Parsinet. You are in the kingdom of Salamanders. I am its queen, and it is with pleasure I have undertaken to conceal you for seven days in my palace, according to the commands of the fairy Favorable. I would only that your stay here might be of longer duration. After these words they were led into a large apartment all of flames, like the rest of the palace, and in which a light shone brighter than that of day. The queen gave that evening a grand supper, composed of every delicacy and well served. After the feast they repaired to a terrace, to witness a display of fireworks of marvellous beauty and great singularity of design, which were let off in a large courtyard of the Palace of Salamanders. Twelve cupids were seen upon as many columns of various coloured marbles. Six of them appeared to be drawing their bows, and the other six bore a large shield, on which these words were written in letters of fire. Irolite, that matchless fair, conqueror is everywhere. In vain our flaming arrows fly. Those that issue from her eye burn more fiercely, yet are found cherished in the hearts they wound. The young princess blushed at her own fame, and Parsin Parsinet was enchanted that the salamanders considered her as beautiful as she appeared to him. Meanwhile, the cupids shot their flaming arrows which, crossing each other in the air, formed in a thousand places the initials of the lovely name of Eolite, and rose up to the heavens. The seven days she remained in the palace were passed in similar pleasures. Parsin Parsinet remarked that all the salamanders were witty and charmingly vivacious, very gallant and affectionate. The queen herself appeared not to be exempt from the influence of the tender passion, but to be enamoured of a young salamander of wonderful beauty. The eighth day they quitted, with regret, a retreat so congenial to their feelings. They found themselves in a lovely country. Parsin Parsinet looked at his ring, and discovered engraved upon the metals, 
which were now all four mixed together, the following words. You have wished too soon. These words sadly afflicted the prince and princess, but they were now so near the abode of the fairy Favorable that they were in hope of arriving there before evening. This reflection consoled them, and they proceeded invoking fortune and love, but alas, they are frequently treacherous conductors. Paltzan Parsinet was, in short, on the point of entering the dominions of the fairy Favorable, but Ormond, obeying the commands of Danamo, had not retired far from the spot where the fire had risen between him and his rival. He had encamped, with his party, behind a wood, and his sentinels, who kept incessant watch, brought him word that the prince and princess had reappeared in the plain. He ordered his men to mount, and about sunset encountered the unfortunate prince and the divine Irolit. Panzan Parsinet was not dismayed at the numbers that fell upon him altogether. He charged them with a courage that daunted them. "'I fulfil my promise to beautiful Irolite,' he exclaimed as he drew his sabre. "'I will die for you or deliver you from your enemies.' With these words he made a blow at the foremost, and felled him to the earth. But, oh, unexpected misfortune, the wonderful sabre which was the gift of the fairy Dinamo flew into a thousand pieces. She had foreseen this result of the combat. Whenever she made a present of weapons, she charmed them in so peculiar a manner, that the instant they were employed against her, the first blow shivered them to pieces. Bazen Parsonet, then disarmed, could not make any prolonged resistance. He was overwhelmed by numbers taken, laden with chains, and the young Irolite shared his fate. "'Ah, fairy favorable!' mournfully ejaculated the prince. "'Abandon me to all the severity of Danamo, but save the fair Irolite!' "'You have disobeyed the fairy,' replied a youth of surprising beauty, who appeared in the air. "'You must suffer the penalty.' Had you not been so prodigal of her favour, we should to-day have saved you for ever from the cruelties of Danamo. All the empire of the sylphs laments being deprived of the glory of securing happiness to so charming a prince and so beautiful a princess. So saying, he vanished, and Pazdan Pansinet groaned at the recollection of his imprudence. He seemed insensible to his own misfortunes, but how deeply did he feel those of Hippolyte? His remorse at having been the cause of them would have destroyed him, had not destiny resolved that he should live to suffer still more cruel agony. The young Irolite had displayed a courage worthy of the illustrious race from which she had descended, and the pitiless Ormond, far from being affected at so touching a spectacle, strove to aggravate the misery he occasioned them. He had the prisoners separated, and so deprived them of the melancholy pleasure of mingling their tears over their departed hopes. Their wretched journey ended, they were taken to the palace of the wicked fairy. She felt a malignant joy at seeing the young prince and princess in a state that would have awakened pity in the heart of any other creature. Even Aziera commiserated Parzen Parsinet, but did not dare evince it before the fairy. "'I shall at length, then,' said the cruel queen, addressing herself to the prince, "'have the pleasure of revenging myself for thy ingratitude. Go!' In lieu of ascending to the throne, my father had destined thee, enter the prison on the sea, in which thou shalt end thy wretched life in frightful tortures. I prefer the most horrible dungeon, replied the prince, looking proudly at her, to the favours of so unjust a queen as thou art. These words increased the irritation of the fairy. She had expected to see him humble himself at her feet. She sent him instantly to the prison she had fixed upon. Irolite wept as he was dragged away. Azir could not suppress her sighs, and all the court mourned in secret at the merciless sentence. As for the beautiful Irolite, the queen had her removed to the chateau, in which she had previously so long resided, placed a strict guard upon her, and treated her with all the inhumanity of which she was capable. The prison to which they conveyed the prince was a frightful tower in the midst of the sea, built on a little desert island. They shut him up in it, laden with irons, and treated him with all the severity imaginable. What an abode for a prince worthy to reign over the universe! To think of Irolite was his sole occupation. He invoked the help of the fairy Favorable for his dear princess alone, and wished a thousand times a day to expiate by death the only injury he had done her. 
His faithful slave had been consigned to the same prison, but he had not the satisfaction of serving his illustrious master, and Parsin Parsinet had about him none but fierce soldiers, devoted to the fairy, who nevertheless, while obeying her orders, respected, despite themselves, the unfortunate captive. His youth, his beauty, and, above all, his courage, excited in them an admiration which compelled them to regard him as a man very superior to all others. The prudent Mana had been dragged to the chateau in which they had immured Irolite, as the prince's faithful slave had been to the prison on the sea. Danamo's women alone approached the princess, and by the fairy's orders overwhelmed her every moment with new misery by their accounts of the sufferings of Parsan Parsinet. The distress of her lover made Irolite forget her own, and everything renewed her tears in that spot where she had so often heard that charming prince swear to her eternal fidelity. Alas, she murmured to herself, why have you been so faithful, my dear prince? Your inconstancy would have killed me, but what of that? You would have lived and been happy. After three months' suffering, Dinamo, who had employed that period in the preparation of a spell of extraordinary power, sent to Irolite one morning a couple of lamps, one of gold, the other of crystal, commanding her to keep one of the two always burning, but leaving her to choose which she would light. Irolite, with her natural docility, sent word that she would obey the fairy's orders without even seeking to comprehend their object. She carried the two lamps carefully to a cabinet. The golden one was lighted when she received it, and therefore she allowed it to burn throughout that day and night, and the next morning she lighted the other. In this manner she continued to obey the fairy, lighting the lamps alternately for fifteen days, when her health became seriously affected. She attributed her failing strength to her sorrow, and to increase her grief, they informed her that Parsin Parsinet was exceedingly ill. What tidings for Irolite! Her deep distress, her utter prostration, affected all her attendants. One evening, when the rest were asleep, one of them softly approached the princess, and seeing her about to light the crystal lamp, said to her, "'Extinguish that fatal light. Your existence depends upon it. Save the life of one so lovely from the cruel designs of Dinamo.' "'Alas!' feebly replied the wretched Irolite. "'She has rendered my life so miserable.' that it is but kind of the fairy to afford me such a means of ending it. But, added she, with an emotion which brought back the colour to her pale cheeks, what life depends upon the golden lamp, which I have been equally careful to light in its turn? That of Pads and Basinet, answered the confidant of Danamo, for the woman was but obeying her orders in thus speaking to the princess. The wicked fairy wished to torment her by this revelation of the cruel task she had imposed upon her. At this intelligence her agony at having unconsciously hastened the termination of her lover's existence deprived her for some considerable time of her senses. On recovering them, she at the same time returned to her despair. "'Hateful fairy!' she exclaimed as soon as she had power to speak. "'Barbarous fairy! Will not my death satisfy thy vengeance?' Wouldst thou contemn me, inhuman, to destroy with my own hand a prince so dear to me, and so worthy of the most perfect and tender affection? But death, a thousand times more merciful than thou art, will soon deliver me from all the tortures which thy wrath hath invented to rack such fond and faithful hearts. The young princess wept incessantly over the fatal lamp, upon which depended the life of Parsin Parsinet, and from that moment only lighted the one that wasted her own. That she saw burn with joy, regarding it as a sacrifice to love and to her lover. In the meanwhile the wretched prince was prey to tortures which surpassed even his powers of endurance. By command of the fairy, one of his guards, feigning to pity the misfortunes of the illustrious prisoner, informed him that Irolite had consented to marry Prince Ormond. A few days after, he, Parsin Parsinet, had been consigned to the frightful dungeon in which he still languished. That the princess had appeared quite happy since her marriage, that she had been present at all the entertainments given in celebration of it, and had finally quitted the country with her husband. This was the only misfortune the prince had not anticipated— and it was also the only one too heavy for him to bear. What? he exclaimed despairingly. Thou art faithless to me, dear Aeolid. Thou art the bride of Ormond. 
thou hast not even pitied my misfortunes thou hast but thought how to end those my love brought upon thyself thou hast not even pitied my misfortunes thou hast but thought how to end those my love brought upon thyself live happy ungrateful irrelite inconstant as thou art i still adore thee and desire but to die for love as thou wouldst not i should have the glory of dying for thee whilst parcin parcinet was plunged in this affliction and the tender irrelite wasted her own life to prolong that of her lover dinamo was moved by the despair of azir who was dying with sorrow for the sufferings of parcin parcinet the cruel fairy perceived at length that to save the life of her child it was necessary to pardon the prince and to permit azir to visit him and to promise him all the benefits that had previously awaited him provided he consented to marry her and the fairy determined to put Irolite to death the moment the prince had accepted that offer. The hope of again beholding Parsin Parsinet restored Azir to life, and the fairy allowed her to send to Irolite's chateau for the golden lamp, which she desired to keep in her own custody, that she might be certain that it was not lighted. This mandate seemed more cruel than all the others to the affected Irolite. What anxiety did she not endure respecting the fate of Parsin Parsinet? "'Do not distress yourself so much about the prince,' said the women in attendance upon her. "'He is going to marry the princess Azir, and it is she who, interested in the preservation of his life, has sent for the lamp upon which it depends.' The torments of jealousy had as yet been wanting to complete the misery of the unfortunate Irolite. At these words she felt them waking in her heart— in the meanwhile, Azir had visited the prince and offered him her hand and her kingdoms. Then, pretending to be ignorant that he had been told that Irolite had married Ormond, she endeavoured to convince him by citing this example, that he had been more than sufficiently constant. Parsin Parsinet, to whom nothing was valuable without the charming Irolite, preferred his prison and his sufferings to liberty and sovereignty. Azir was distracted at his refusal— and her affliction rendered her almost as unhappy as he was. During this time the fairy Favorable, who had hitherto boasted of her insensibility to love, had found it impossible to resist the attractions of a young prince residing at her court. He had conceived a passion for her. The fairy had considerable difficulty in bringing herself to let him know that his attentions had conquered her pride. At length, however, she yielded to the desire of acquainting him with his triumph. The pleasure of conversing with those we love appeared to her then so charming and so desirable that, excusing the fault she had so severely punished, she repaired in all haste to the assistance of Balsen Parsinet and the beautiful Irolite. A little later, and her aid would have been useless. The fatal lamp of Irolite had but six days longer to burn, and the grief of Parsin Parsinet was rapidly terminating his existence when the fairy Favorable arrived at the palace of Dinamo. She was by far the most powerful, and made herself obeyed despite the anger of the wicked fairy. The prince was released from prison, but he would not quit it until he was assured by Favorable that the fair Irolite might still be his bride. He appeared, notwithstanding his pallor, more beautiful than the day, the light of which he was once more permitted to behold. He repaired with the fairy Favorable to the chateau of his princess. Her lamp emitted but a feeble light, and the dying Irolite would not allow them to extinguish it until she had been assured of the fidelity of her now happy lover. There are no words capable of expressing the perfect joy experienced by the fond pair at this meeting. The fairy Favorable restored them in an instant to all their former health and beauty, and endowed them with long life and constant felicity. Their affection she found it impossible to increase. Dinamo, furious at beholding her authority thus overthrown, perished by her own hand. The fate of Azir and Ormond was left by the prince to the decision of Irolite. The only vengeance she took upon them was uniting them in marriage, and Parsin Parsinet, as generous as he was constant, would only receive his father's kingdom, leaving Azir to reign over those of Dinamo. The nuptials of the prince and the divine Irolite were celebrated with infinite magnificence, and after duly expressing their gratitude to the fairy Favorable and heaping rewards on the slave in the prudent manner, they departed for their kingdom, where the prince and the charming Irolite 
enjoyed the rare happiness of loving as fondly and truly in prosperity as they had done in adversity. End of section number eight. Recording by Peter Darby. Voice over Pete Darby. Dot com. Section nine of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Anguillette by the Countess de Murat. Translated by James Planchet. Anguillette, Part 1. To whatever greatness destiny may elevate those it favours, there is no worldly felicity exempt from serious sorrow. One cannot be acquainted with fairies and be ignorant that the most skilful amongst them have failed to discover a charm which would secure them from the misfortune of being compelled to change their shape some few days in every month for that of some animal, terrestrial, celestial, or aquatic. During that dangerous period, when they are completely at the mercy of mankind, they have frequently great difficulty in saving themselves from the perils to which that stern necessity exposes them. One amongst them, who had changed herself into an eel, was unfortunately taken by fishermen, and flung immediately into a small square tank in the midst of a beautiful meadow, wherein they kept the fish that were daily required for the table of the king of that country. Anguillette, so was the fairy named, found in her new abode a great many fine fish, destined like herself to live but a few hours. She had heard the fishermen say to one another that that very evening the king proposed to give a grand banquet, for the which these fine fish had been carefully selected. What tidings for the unfortunate fairy! She accused the fates of cruelty a thousand times. She sighed most sadly, but after hiding herself for some time at the very bottom of the water, in order to bewail her misfortune in solitude, the desire to escape, if possible, from so urgent a peril induced her to look about her in every direction, to see if she could not by some means get out of the reservoir, and regain the river, which ran at no great distance from that spot. But the fairy looked in vain. The tank was too deep for her to hope to get out of it without help, and her distress was augmented by seeing the fishermen who had taken her again approaching. They began to throw in their nets, and Anguillette, by avoiding them with great cunning, retarded for a few moments the death that awaited her. The youngest of the king's daughters was walking at that time in the meadow. She approached the tank to amuse herself by seeing the men fish. The sun about to set shone brilliantly on the water. The skin of Anguillette, which was very glossy, glittered in its rays as if partly gilt, and of all the colours of the rainbow. The young princess caught sight of her, and thinking her exceedingly beautiful, ordered the fisherman to try and catch that eel for her. They obeyed, and the unfortunate fairy was speedily placed in the hands of the person who would decide her fate. When the princess had contemplated Anguillette for a few moments, she was touched with compassion, and running to the riverside, put her gently into the water. This unexpected service filled the fairy's heart with gratitude. She appeared on the surface and said to the princess, I owe you my life, generous Plusine, such was her name, but it is most fortunate for you that I do so. Be not afraid, she continued, observing the young princess about to run away, I am a fairy, and will prove the truth of my words by heaping an infinite number of favours upon you. As people were accustomed in those days to behold fairies, Plusine recovered from her first alarm, and listened with great attention to the agreeable promises of Anguillette. She even began to answer her, but the fairy interrupting her said, Wait till you have profited by my favour before you express your acknowledgments. Go, young princess, and return to this spot tomorrow morning. Think in the meantime what you would wish for, and whatever it may be, I will grant it. You may, at your choice, possess the most perfect and bewitching beauty, the finest and most charming intellect, or incalculable riches. After these words, Anguillette sank to the bottom of the river, and left Plusine highly gratified with her adventure. 
she determined not to tell any one what had befallen her, for, said she to herself, if Anguillette should deceive me, my sisters would believe that I invented this story. After this little reflection, she hastened to rejoin her suite, which was composed of only a few ladies. She found them looking for her. The young Plucine was occupied all the succeeding night in thinking what should be her choice. Beauty almost turned the scale, but as she had sufficient sense to desire still more, she finally determined to request that favour of the fairy. She rose with the sun and ran to the meadow under the pretence of gathering flowers to make a garland, as she said, to present to the queen, her mother, at her levee. Her attendants dispersed themselves about the meadow to cull the freshest and most beautiful of the flowers with which it was everywhere enamelled. Meanwhile, the young princess hastened to the riverside and found, upon the spot where she had seen the fairy, a column of white marble of the most perfect purity. An instant afterwards, the column opened and the fairy emerged from it and appeared to the princess no longer as a fish, but as a tall and beautiful woman of majestic demeanour and whose robes and headdress were covered with jewels. "'I am Anguillette,' said she to the young princess, who gazed upon her with great attention. "'I come to fulfil my promise. You have chosen intellectual perfection, and you shall possess it from this very moment. You shall have so much sense as to be envied by those who, till now, have flattered themselves they were specially endowed with it.' The youthful Plucine, at these words, felt a considerable alteration taking place in her mind. She thanked the fairy with an eloquence that till then she had been a stranger to. The fairy smiled at the astonishment the princess could not conceal at her own powers of expression. "'I am so much pleased with you,' said the benignant Anguillette, "'for making the choice you have done, in lieu of preferring beauty of person, which has such charms for one of your sex and age, that to reward you I will add the gift of that loveliness you have so prudently foregone. Return hither to-morrow at the same hour. I give you till then to choose the style of beauty you would possess. The fairy disappeared, and left the young Plucine still more impressed with her good fortune. Her choice of superior intellect was dictated by reason, but the promise of surpassing beauty flattered her heart, and that which touches the heart is always felt most deeply. On quitting the riverside, the princess took the flowers presented to her by her attendants, and made a very tasteful garland with them, which she carried to the queen. But what was her majesty's astonishment, that of the king, and of all the court, to hear Plucine speak with an elegance and a fluency which captivated every heart? The princesses, her sisters, vainly endeavoured to contest her mental superiority. They were compelled to wonder at and admire it. Night came. The princess, occupied with the expectation of becoming beautiful, instead of retiring to rest, passed into a cabinet hung with portraits, in which, under the form of goddesses, were represented several of the queens and princesses of her family. All these were beauties, and she indulged a hope that they would assist her in deciding on a style of beauty worthy to be solicited from a fairy. The first that met her sight was a Juno. She was fair and had a presence such as should distinguish the queen of the gods. Pallas and Venus stood beside her. The subject of the picture was the judgment of Paris. The noble haughtiness of Pallas excited the admiration of the young princess, but the loveliness of Venus almost decided her choice. Nevertheless, she passed on to the next picture, in which was seen Pomona reclining on a couch of turf beneath trees laden with the finest fruits in the world. She appeared so charming that the princess, who since morning had become acquainted with all their stories, was not surprised that a god had taken various forms in order to please her. Diana next appeared, attired as the poets represent her, the quiver slung behind her, and the bow in her hand. She was pursuing a stag, and followed by a numerous band of nymphs. Flora attracted her attention a little further off. She appeared to be walking in a garden, the flowers of which, although exquisite, could not be compared to the bloom of her complexion. Next came the graces, beautiful and enchanting. This picture was the last in the room. But the princess was struck by that which was over the mantelpiece. It was the goddess of youth. A heavenly air was shed over her whole person. Her tresses were the fairest in the world. The turn of her head was most graceful, her mouth charming, her figure perfectly beautiful. 
and her eyes appeared much more likely to intoxicate than the nectar with which she seemed to be filling a cup. "'I will wish,' exclaimed the young princess, after she had contemplated with delight this lovely portrait, "'I will wish to be as beautiful as Hebe, and to remain so as long as possible.' After this determination, she returned to her bedchamber, where the day she awaited seemed to her impatience as if it would never dawn. At length it came, and she hastened again to the riverside. The fairy kept her word. She appeared, and threw a few drops of water in the face of Plucine, who became immediately as beautiful as she had desired to be. Some sea-gods had accompanied the fairy. Their applause was the first effect produced by the charms of the fortunate Plucine. She looked at her image in the water, and could not recognize herself. Her silence and her astonishment were for the moment the only indications of her thankfulness. "'I have fulfilled all your wishes,' said the generous fairy. "'You ought to be content. But I shall not be so, if my favours do not far exceed your desires. In addition to the wit and beauty I have endowed you with, I bestow on you all the treasures at my disposal. They are inexhaustible. You have but to wish, whenever you please, for infinite wealth, and at the same moment you will acquire it not only for yourself, but for all those you may deem worthy to possess it. The fairy disappeared, and the youthful Plucine, now as lovely as Hebe, returned to the palace. Everybody who met her was enchanted. They announced her arrival to the king, who was himself lost in admiration of her, and it was only by her voice and her talent that they recognized the amiable princess. She informed the king that a fairy had bestowed all those precious gifts upon her, and she was no longer called anything but Hebe, in consequence of her perfect resemblance to the portrait of that goddess. What new causes were here to engender the hatred of her sisters against her? The beauties of her mind had excited their jealousy much less than those of her person. All the princes who had been attracted by their charms became faithless to them without the least hesitation. In like manner were all the other court beauties abandoned by their admirers, no tears or reproaches could stop the flight of those inconstant lovers, and this conduct, which then appeared so singular, has since, it is said, become a common custom. Hebe inflamed all hearts around her, while her own remained insensible. Notwithstanding the hatred her sisters evinced towards her, she neglected nothing that she thought might please them. She wished for so much wealth for the eldest, and to wish and to give were the same thing to her that the greatest sovereign in that part of the world requested the hand of that princess in marriage, and the nuptials were celebrated with incredible magnificence. The king, Hebe's father, desired to take the field with a great army. The wishes of his beautiful daughter caused him to succeed in all his enterprises, and his kingdom was filled with such immense wealth that he became the most formidable of all the monarchs in the universe. The divine Hebe, however, weary of the bustle of the court, was anxious to pass a few months in a pleasant mansion a short distance from the capital. She had excluded from it all magnificence, but everything about it was elegant and of a charming simplicity. Nature alone had taken care to embellish the walks which art had not been employed to form. A wood, the paths through which had something wild in their scenery, intersected by rivulets and little torrents that formed natural cascades, surrounded this beautiful retreat. The youthful Hebe often walked in this solitary wood. One day, when her heart felt more than usually oppressed, with a tedium and lassitude to which she was now constantly subject, she endeavoured to ascertain the reason of it. She seated herself on the turf, beside a rivulet that with gentle murmur courted meditation. What sorrow is it, she asked herself, that comes thus to trouble the excess of my happiness? What princess in all the universe is blessed with a lot so perfect as mine. The beneficence of the fairy has accorded me all I wished for. I can heap treasures upon all who surround me. I am adored by all who behold me, and my heart is a stranger to every painful emotion. No, I cannot imagine whence arises the insupportable weariness which has for some time past detracted from the happiness of my life. The young princess was incessantly occupied by this reflection. At length she determined to go to the bank of Anguillette's river, and endeavour to obtain an interview with her. The fairy, accustomed to indulge her inclinations, appeared on the surface of the water. 
It happened to be one of the days when she was changed into a fish. "'It always gives me pleasure to see you, young princess,' said she to Hebe. "'I know you have been passing some time in a very solitary dwelling, and you appear to me in a languishing state, which does not at all correspond with your good fortune. What hails you, Hebe? Confide in me.' "'There is nothing the matter,' replied the young princess, with some embarrassment. "'You have showered too many benefits upon me for anything to be wanting to a felicity which is your own work.' "'You would deceive me,' rejoined the fairy. "'I see it easily. You are no longer satisfied. Yet what more can you desire? Deserve my favour by a frank confession,' added the gracious fairy, "'and I promise you I will again fulfil your wishes.' "'I know not what I wish,' replied the charming Hebe. "'But nevertheless,' she continued, casting down her beautiful eyes, "'I feel a lack of something, and that, whatever it may be, "'it is that which is absolutely essential to my happiness.' "'Ah!' exclaimed the fairy. "'It is love that you are sighing for. "'That passion alone could inspire you with such strange ideas. "'Dangerous disposition,' continued the prudent fairy. You sigh for love. You shall experience it. Hearts are but too naturally disposed to be affected by it. But I warn you that you will vainly invoke me to deliver you from the fatal passion you believe to be so sweet a blessing. My power does not extend so far. I care not, quickly replied the princess, smiling and blushing at the same moment. Alas, of what value to me are all the gifts you have bestowed upon me, if I cannot in turn make with them the happiness of another. The fairy sighed at these words, and sank to the bottom of the river. Hebe traced her steps to the wilderness, her heart filled with a hope which already began to dissipate her melancholy. The warnings of the fairy caused her some anxiety, but her prudent reflections were soon banished by others as dangerous as they were agreeable. On reaching home she found a courier awaiting her with a message from the king, commanding her return to the court that very day, in order that she might be present at an entertainment in preparation for the succeeding one. She took her departure accordingly, a few hours after the receipt of the message, and returned to the court, where she was received with great pleasure by the king and queen, who informed her that a foreign prince, upon his travels, having arrived there a few days previously, they had determined to give him a fit, that he might talk in other countries of the magnificence displayed in their kingdom. The youthful Hebe, obeying a presentiment of which she was unconscious, first inquired of the princess, her sister, if the foreigner was handsome. "'I never yet saw any one that could be compared to him,' answered the princess. "'Describe him to me,' said Hebe, with emotion. "'He is such as they paint heroes,' replied Ilary. "'His form is graceful, his demeanour noble, his eyes are full of a fire that has already made more than one indifferent beauty of this court acknowledge their power. He has the finest head in the world, his hair is dark brown, and the moment he appears he absorbs the attention of all beholders. "'You draw a most charming portrait of him,' said the youthful Hebe. "'Is it not a little flattered?' "'No, sister,' replied the Princess Ilary, with a sigh she could not suppress. "'Alas!' You will find him perhaps but too worthy of admiration. The queen retired, and the beautiful Hebe, as soon as she had time to examine her heart, perceived that she had lost that tranquillity of which till now she had not known the value. Anguillette, she exclaimed, as soon as she was alone, alas, what is this object which you have allowed to present itself to my sight? Your prudent counsels are rendered vain by its presence. Why do you not give me strength enough to resist such attractive charms. It may be, however, that their power surpasses that of any fairy. Hebe slept but little that night. She rose very early, and the thought of how she should dress herself for the fete that evening occupied her the whole day, to a degree she had been previously a stranger to, for it was the first time she had felt an anxiety to please. The young foreigner, actuated by the same desire, neglected nothing that might make him appear agreeable to the eyes of the charming Hebe. The princess Ilary was equally solicitous of conquest. She possessed a thousand attractions, and when Hebe was not beside her, she was considered the most beautiful creature in the world. But Hebe outshone everyone. The queen gave a magnificent ball that evening. It was succeeded by a marvellous banquet. The young foreigner would have been struck by its prodigious splendour, 
if he could have looked at anything besides Hebe. After the banquet, a novel and brilliant illumination shed another daylight over the palace gardens. It was summer-time. The company descended into the gardens for the pleasure of an evening promenade. The handsome foreigner conducted the queen, but this honour did not compensate him for being deprived of the company of his princess, even for a few moments. The trees were decorated with festoons of flowers, and the lamps which formed the illumination were disposed in a manner to represent, in every direction, bows, arrows, and other weapons of Cupid, together in some places with inscriptions. The company entered a little grove, illuminated like the rest of the gardens, and the queen seated herself beside a pleasant fountain, around which had been arranged seats of turf, ornamented with garlands of pinks and roses. Whilst the queen was engaged in conversation with the king, and a host of courtiers that surrounded them, the princesses amused themselves by reading the sentences formed by small lamps under the various devices. The handsome foreigner was at that moment close to the beautiful Hebe. She turned her eyes towards a spot in which appeared a shower of darts, and read aloud these words which were displayed beneath them. Some are inevitable. They are those which are shot from the eyes of the divine Hebe, quickly added the prince, looking at her tenderly. The princess heard him, and felt confused. But the prince drew from her embarrassment a happy augury of his love, as it appeared unmingled with anger. The fete terminated with a thousand delightful novelties. The charms of the stranger had touched too sensibly the heart of Illyrie for her to be long without perceiving that he loved another. The prince had paid her some attention previous to the arrival of Hebe at court, but since he had seen the latter, he had been wholly engrossed by his passion. In the meanwhile, the young stranger endeavoured, by every proof of affection, to touch the heart of the beautiful princess. He was devoted, amiable. Her fate compelled her to love, and the fairy abandoned her to the inclinations of her heart. What excuses for yielding? She could no longer struggle against herself. The charming stranger had informed her that he was the son of a king, and that his name was Atimir. This name was known to the princess. The prince had performed wonders in a war between the two kingdoms, and as they had always been opposed to each other, he had not chosen to appear at the court of Hebe's royal father under his real name. The young princess, after a conversation during which her heart fully imbibed the sweet and dangerous poison of which the fairy had warned her, gave permission to Atimir to disclose to the king his rank and his love. The young prince was transported with delight. He flew to the king's apartments and urged his suit with all the eloquence his love could inspire him with. The king conducted him to the queen. This proposed marriage, assuring the establishment of a lasting peace between the two kingdoms, the hand of the beautiful Hebe was promised to her happy lover as soon as he had received the consent of the king, his father. The news was soon circulated, and the princess Illyrie suffered anguish equal to her jealousy. She wept, she groaned, but it was necessary to control her emotion and conceal her vain regrets. The beautiful Hebe and Atimir now saw each other continually. Their affection increased daily, and in those happy days the princess could not imagine why the fairies did not employ all their skills to make mortals fall in love when they wished, to ensure their felicity. An ambassador from Atimir's royal father arrived at court. He had been awaited with the utmost impatience. He was the bearer of the required consent, and preparations were immediately commenced for the celebration of those grand nuptials. Atimir had therefore no longer any reason for anxiety, a dangerous state for a lover one desires to retain faithful. As soon as the prince felt certain of his happiness, he became less ardent. One day that he was on his way to meet the fair Hebe in the palace gardens, he heard the voices of females in conversation in a bower of honeysuckles. He caught the sound of his name, and this awakened his curiosity to know more. He approached the bower softly, and easily recognised the voice of the princess Illyrie. "'I shall die before that fatal day, my dear Cleonice,' said she to a young person seated beside her. "'The gods will not permit me to behold the ungrateful object of my love united to the too fortunate Hebe. My torments are too keen to endure much longer.' "'But, madam,' replied her female companion, Prince Atimir is not faithless. He has never avowed love for you. Destiny alone is to blame for your misfortunes, and amongst all the princes who adore you, 
you might find, perhaps, one more amiable than he is, did not a fatal prepossession engross your heart. More amiable than him, rejoined Illyri. Is there such a being in the universe? Powerful fairy, she added with a sigh. Of all the blessings with which you have laid in the fortunate Hebe, I but covet that of Atomir's devoted attachment to her. The words of the princess were interrupted by her tears. Ah, how happy would she have been had she known how much those tears had moved the heart of Atomir. She rose to leave the bower, and the prince hid himself behind some trees to escape observation. The tears and the love of Valeri had affected him deeply, but he imagined they were but the emotions of pity which he felt for a beautiful princess whom he had unintentionally made so miserable. He proceeded to join Hebe, and the contemplation of her charms banished for the moment all other thoughts from his mind. In passing through the gardens, as he returned with the princess Hebe to the palace, he trod upon something which attracted his attention. He picked it up and found it was a set of magnificent tablets. It was not far from the bower in which he had overheard the conversation of Illyrie and her attendant. He feared if Hebe saw the tablets, she would obtain some knowledge of his adventure. He hid them, therefore, without her having observed them. She happened at that moment to be occupied in readjusting some ornament in her headdress. That evening Illyrie did not make her appearance in the Queen's apartments. It was reported that she had felt indisposed on returning from her walk. Atomir perfectly understood that her object was to conceal the agitation to which he had seen her a prey in the bower of honeysuckles. This reflection increased his compassion for her. As soon as he had retired to his own chamber, he opened the tablets he had picked up. On the first leaf he saw a cipher, formed of a double A, crowned with a wreath of myrtle, and supported by two little cupids, one of whom appeared to be wiping the tears from his cheeks with the end of the ribbon that bandaged his eyes, and the other breaking his arrows. The sight of this cipher agitated the young prince. He knew that Illyrie drew admirably. He turned over the leaf quickly to gain further information, and on the opposite side found the following lines. Hither all conquering love thy footsteps led, at thy first glance sweet peace my bosom fled, O cruel one to try on me the dart with which you meant to wound another's heart. The handwriting which he recognised but too clearly proved to him that the tablets were those of the Princess Illyrie. He was affected by the great tenderness of these sentiments, which, far from being nourished by his love and attentions, were not even encouraged by hope. These verses reminded him that previous to the arrival of Hebe at court, he had thought Illyrie lovely. He began to consider himself unfaithful to that princess, and he became too seriously so to the charming Hebe. He struggled, however, against these first emotions, but his heart was accustomed to range, and so dangerous a habit is rarely corrected. He threw Illyrie's tablets on a table, resolving not to look at them any more, but he took them up again a moment afterwards, despite himself, and found in them a thousand things which completed the triumph of Illyrie over the divine Hebe. The prince's heart was occupied all night by conflicting feelings. In the morning he waited on the king, who named the day he had fixed on for his marriage with Hebe. Atomir replied with an embarrassment which the king mistook for a proof of his passion. How little do we know of the human heart. It was the effect of his inconstancy. The king desired to visit the queen. The prince was obliged to follow him. He had been there but a short time when the princess Illyrie appeared with an air of melancholy which made her more lovely in the eyes of the inconstant Atomir, who was aware of its cause. He approached her and talked to her for some time. He gave her to understand that he was no longer ignorant of her affection for him. He spoke with ardour of his feelings for her. It was too much for Illyrie. Ah, how is it possible to receive calmly the assurance of so great, so unexpected a happiness? The charming Hebe entered the Queen's apartments shortly afterwards. Her sight brought the blood into the cheeks both of the Princess Illyrie and of the fickle Atomir. How beautiful she is, exclaimed Illyrie, looking at the prince with an emotion she could not conceal. Avoid her, sir, or end at once my existence. The prince had not power to answer her. Hebe approached them with a grace and charm which unconsciously loaded with reproaches the ungrateful Atomir. He could not long endure his position. 
He quitted the princess, saying that he was anxious to dispatch a courier to his father. She was so prepossessed in his favour that she never noticed some eloquent glances at Illyrie, which he cast on leaving her. While Illyrie triumphed in secret, the beautiful Hebe learned from the king and queen that in three days she was to be the bride of Atene. How unworthy was he of the sensations which this news awakened in the heart of the lovely Hebe. The faithless prince, though preoccupied by his new passion, passed part of the day in Hebe's company. Illyrie was present, and was a thousand times ready to die with jealousy. Her love had redoubled since she had entertained hope. On returning to his own apartments in the evening, the prince was presented with a note by an unknown messenger. He opened it hastily, and found in it these words. I yield to a passion a thousand times stronger than my reason. Since I can no longer attempt to conceal sentiments which chance has revealed to you, come, prince, come, and learn the determination to which I am driven by the love you have inspired me with. Oh, how happy will it be for me if it costs me but my life. The bearer of the note informed the prince that he was commissioned to conduct him to the spot where the princess Illyrie awaited him. Atimir did not hesitate a moment to follow him, and after several turnings he was introduced into a little pavilion at the end of a very dark avenue. The interior of the pavilion was sufficiently lighted. He found in it Illyrie with one of her attendants. The rest were walking in the gardens. When she had retired to this apartment, no one entered it without her orders. Illyrie was seated on a pile of cushions of crimson and gold embroidery. Her dress was rich and elegant, the material being of yellow and silver tissue. Her hair, which was black and exceedingly beautiful, was ornamented with ribbons of the same colour as the dress, and ties of yellow diamonds. At her sight, Atimir could not persuade himself that infidelity was a crime. He knelt at her feet, and Illyrie, gazing upon him with a tenderness sufficiently indicative of the emotion of her heart, said, Prince, I have not caused you to come hither in order to persuade you to break off your marriage. I know too well it is determined upon, and the expressions with which you have endeavoured to alleviate my misfortune and flatter my affection do not induce me to believe that you would abandon Hebe for me. But, she continued, with a gush of tears, which completed the conquest of the heart of Atimir, I will not endure the life which you have rendered so wretched. I will sacrifice it without regret to my love. And this poison, she added, showing a little box which she had in her hand, will save me from the fearful torment of seeing you the husband of Hebe. No, beautiful Illyrie, exclaimed the fickle prince, I will never be her husband. I will abandon all for your sake. I love you a thousand times better than I loved Hebe, and despite my duty and my faith so solemnly plighted, I am ready to fly with you to a spot where no obstacle shall exist to our happiness. Ah, prince, said Illyrie with a sigh, can I confide, then, in one so faithless? He will never be faithless to you, rejoined Atimir, and the king, your father, who gave Hebe to me, will not refuse to sanction my union with the lovely Illyrie when she is already mine. Away, then, Atimir, said the princess, after a few minutes' silence. Let us hasten whither our destiny leads us. Whatever misery the step entails on me, nothing can weigh against the sweet delights of loving and being beloved. After these words they consulted together respecting their flight. There was no time to lose. They determined to depart the following night. They separated with regret, and, notwithstanding the vows of Atimir, Illyrie still feared the power of Hebe's attractions. The rest of that night and all the next day she was a prey to that anxiety. In the meanwhile the prince hurriedly gave all the necessary orders for keeping his departure secret, and the next day, as soon as everybody in the palace had retired to their apartments, he hastened to join Illyrie in the pavilion in the garden, where she awaited him, attended only by Cleonice. They set out and made incredible haste to pass the frontiers of the kingdom. The following morning the news was made public by a letter which Illyrie had written to the queen, and another which Atimir had addressed to the king. They were couched in touching language, and it was easy to perceive that love had dictated them. The king and queen were extremely enraged, but no words can express the agony of the unfortunate and charming Hebe. What despair! What tears! What petitions to the fairy Anguillette 
to terminate torments equal to the most cruel she had predicted. But the fairy kept her word. In vain did he beseek the riverside, and Guillette did not appear, and she abandoned herself to all the horrors of desperation. The princes, who had been discouraged by the success of the ungrateful Atomir, now felt their hopes revise. But their attentions and professions only increased the torture of the faithful Hebe. The king ardently desired that she should select for herself a husband, and had several times urged her to do so. But that duty appeared too cruel to her affectionate heart. She determined to fly from her father's kingdom, but before her departure she went once more in search of Anguillette. The fairy could no longer resist the tears of the beautiful Hebe. She appeared to her, and at her sight the princess wept still more, and had not the power to speak to her. "'You have now experienced,' said the fairy, "'what that fatal pleasure, which I would never willingly have accorded to you, is. But Atimir has too severely punished you, Hebe, for your neglect of my advice. Go, fly these scenes, where everything recalls to you the remembrance of your love. You will find a vessel on the coast, which will bear you to the only spot in the world where you can be cured of your unfortunate attachment. But take care, added Anguillette, raising her voice, when your heart shall have regained its tranquillity, that you never seek to behold again the faithless Atomir, or it will cost you your life. Hebe wished more than once to see that prince again, at whatever price love might compel her to pay for that gratification. But a whisper of reason and respect for her own honour induced her to accept the fairy's offer. She thanked her for this last favour, and departed the next morning for the sea-coast, followed by such of her women as she had most confidence in. She found the vessel Anguillette had promised her. It was gilt all over. The masts were of marquetry of the most admirable pattern, the sails of rose-colour and silver tissue, and in every part of it was inscribed the word Liberty. The crew were attired in dresses of the same colours as the sails. All appeared to breathe in this atmosphere the sweet air of freedom. The princess entered a magnificent cabin. The furniture was admirable, and the paintings perfect. She was as much a prey to sorrow in this new abode as she was in her father's court. They strove in vain to amuse her by a thousand pleasures. She was not yet in a state of mind to pay the slightest attention to them. One day, while she was contemplating a painting in her cabin, which represented a landscape, she remarked in it a young shepherd, who, with a smiling countenance, was depicted cutting nets to set at liberty a great number of birds that had been caught in them, and some of these little creatures seemed to be soaring to the skies with marvellous velocity. All the other pictures displayed similar subjects. None suggested an idea of love, and all appeared to boast the charms of liberty. Alas, exclaimed the princess sorrowfully, will my heart never enjoy that sweet happiness which reason prays for so often in vain? End of section nine. End of Anguillette, part one.